Eines Morgens in aller Frühe Bella Ciao, Bella Ciao, Bella Ciao, Ciao, Ciao Eines Morgens in aller Frühe Trafen wir auf unseren Feind Eines Morgens in aller Frühe the bourgeois press hailed the Freikorps marching into Berlin for their saving of the city from anarchy and dictatorship. A funny combination of words. They continued to praise them as they were slaughtering revolutionaries with utmost brutality. The press managed to turn people of the lower classes into a mob celebrating the brutality against anyone slightly suspicious. The slaughter turned into a vicious cycle as part of the brutality was attributed to the Spartacists, which was then used to justify even harsher killing. The social democrat outlet Vorwärts openly called for the murder of Spartacist leaders, quote, many hundred corpses in a row, proletarians, Karl, Rosa, Radek and company, not one of them lies there, proletarians. Witnesses testified that at the time, Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg had been offered a head prize of 50,000 marks each by Scheidemann and Georg Sklarz, a newly rich war millionaire who was a close friend of Scheidemann. Many revolutionaries fled the city, but Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht decided to stay there, merely hiding while continuing to edit the KPD paper Die Rote Fahne, the red flag, in English. It's likely because both of them didn't want to abandon the Berlin working class and because they were not as afraid of being caught and put to prison, they were both very used to that. Maybe they were not expecting that their lives were on the line this time around. On January 14th, they both hid in an apartment of Luxembourg's friend in Wilmersdorf in the district Charlottenburg-Wilmersdorf in Berlin. It is here where they both wrote their last articles. Liebknecht wrote, quote, The defeated of today will be the victors of tomorrow. And whether we will still live when it will be achieved, our program will be alive. It will dominate the world of redeemed mankind, in spite of everything. Luxembourg went to sleep on the evening of January 15th. Someone came in. But it was just Wilhelm Pieck who had come to the apartment and brought forged identity papers for the two of them. But then, at 8.30 p.m., the landlord came to ask for Karl and Rosa. After denying they were there, five soldiers entered the apartment without any warrant and took both of them. The operation was conducted by the Garde Cavalerie Schützendivision, or the GKSD, a military division which was led by first general staff, officer captain or Hauptmann in German, Waldemar Papst. The GKSD received outside funding from two German industrialists, Hugo Stinnes and Friedrich Minou. Papst himself had excellent relations with the Berlin Council of Reich Citizens, an anti-communist alliance of bourgeois politicians and businessmen. He was close friends with its chairman, the millionaire banker Salomon Marx. Pabst was also tied to Eduard Stadler, chairman of the Anti-Bolshevik League, which was itself funded very well by the German business class. So Pabst, as other notorious anti-communist killers in history, was the hound of the rich. Both Pabst and Noske had monitored Liebknecht's written correspondence being in close connection to various espionage organizations and state prosecutors Pabst had received tips about the location of Rosa Luxemburg the ultimate source to the tip remains a secret to this day Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht arrived at the Eden Hotel for questioning at 10 p.m. Major Pabst recalls questioning Rosa Luxemburg are you Frau Luxemburg in response she said Please decide for yourself. Then he said, according to this picture, it must be you. And then she countered, if you say so. After Hauptmann Pabst questioned both of them, he wrote his report, which would appear in all newspapers the next day, that Liebknecht was shot because he was trying to flee, and Luxembourg was caught by an angry mob who took her to an unknown place. The SPD paper Vorwärts wrote on January 16th that Liebknecht was, quote, shot while trying to escape, and Luxembourg was, quote, killed by the people. The truth was different, however. 
Rosa Luxemburg had her skull smashed. Liebknecht was beaten in the head with a rifle and both were dragged into a car, bleeding heavily. Rosa Luxemburg was shot in the head immediately after leaving Hotel Eden at 11.45 pm, dying instantly and thrown into the Landwehr Canal at the Liechtenstein Bridge in the Berlin center. Liebknecht was shot in the back of the head and delivered to the morgue as an unidentified corpse. Luxemburg's body wasn't recovered for months. The German poet Bertolt Brecht wrote, quote, Red Rosa now has vanished too. Where she lies is hid from view. She told the poor what life is about, and so the rich have rubbed her out. It took years and decades to uncover bit by bit what had happened that day. A truth the Social Democrats had no interest in revealing. The German Revolution was still far from over and it was only years later when German capitalists achieved full stability. In January, the ruling class's forces numbered about 10,000 men, hardly enough to control the whole state. But the defeat of the revolutionaries in January gave them the upper hand in slowly but surely consolidating their monopoly on violence and preparing for their final onslaught. The communist movement was deprived of its two most prestigious idols, the symbols of the German Revolution, an incredible success in the eyes of German capitalism. It was a tragic event that was felt by the workers' movement worldwide and still is to this day. Four days later, on January 19th, Lenin told the morning crowd that had assembled in Moscow, quote, Today, the bourgeoisie and the social traders are jubilating in Berlin. They have succeeded in murdering Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. Ebert and Scheidemann, who for four years led the workers to the slaughter for the sake of depredation, have now assumed the role of butchers of the proletarian leaders. The example of the German Revolution proves that democracy is only a camouflage for bourgeois robbery and the most savage violence. Death to the butchers. Two months later, the Communist International put out the following statement, quote, The murder of Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg is an event of world historical significance, not only because the best people and leaders of the truly proletarian Communist International perished tragically, but also because it finally showed up the class character of the leading European state, of, it can be said without exaggeration, the leading state in the world. The western crossing of a double bridge in the Berlin district of Tiergarten has been named Rosa Luxemburg Bridge, or Footbridge, since 2012. Under the bridge there is a monument to Rosa Luxemburg, whose body is said to have been thrown into the canal at about this point. One of the larger streets in the Berlin district of Mitte, around Alexanderplatz, was renamed from Kaiser Wilhelmstrasse to Karl Liebknechtstrasse, Karl Liebknecht Street. Revolutionaries who weren't successful in achieving revolution are often idolized in hindsight within the mainstream. After their deaths, when they are no longer a danger to the status quo, they are made into fallen heroes who fought for some liberal variant of humanity. Yet, during the time they are engaged in political struggle, they are demonized by the media and the political establishment. Timeless is the quote from Lenin in chapter 1 of the State and Revolution, quote, During the life of great revolutionaries, the oppressing classes constantly hounded them, received their theories with the most savage malice, the most furious hatred, and the most unscrupulous campaigns of lies and slander. After their death, attempts are made to convert them into harmless icons to canonize them, so to say, and to hollow their names to a certain extent for the consolation of the oppressed classes and with the object of duping the latter, while at the same time robbing the revolutionary theory of its substance, blunting its revolutionary edge and vulgarizing it. Today, the bourgeoisie and the opportunists within the labor movement concur in this doctoring of Marxism. They omit obscure or distort the revolutionary side of this theory, its revolutionary soul. They push to the foreground and extol what is or seems acceptable to the bourgeoisie. All the social chauvinists are now Marxists. Don't laugh. 
Aside from these more superficial monuments to the revolutionaries, many social democrats play down their role in the murder of Luxembourg and Karl Liebknecht to this day. For instance, they criticize the harsh assessment of liberal historian Hafner because of course now Luxembourg and Liebknecht enjoy high prestige even among the mainstream. Major Pabst, who supervised the murder of Karl and Rosa, wrote later that he reported directly to the government and shook hands with Ebert and Noske, who congratulated him. Many refer to the lack of proof that this handshake had happened. But is it really surprising that the most bloody traitor of the working class and social fascist Gustav Noske would shake hands with Pabst, who for years engaged in a cover-up activity of the murder, who for years led the anti-communist troops? But is it really important if that single handshake happened when the Social Democrat government collaborated closely with the Freikorps, with Noske ordering them to closely monitor the movements of Luxembourg and Liebknecht a few days before they were killed, with Social Democrat papers calling for their murder, bounties that were put on their heads, with them utterly betraying and suffocating the revolutionary movement? A day later, Scheidemann quite openly approved of their murder by saying that they, quote, have fallen victim to their own bloody terror tactics. For decades, their murders were defended by liberal and social democrat voices. Surprisingly, on November 9th of 2017, SPD leader Andrea Nahles admitted that it was likely that Noske had had a hand in the murder of Luxembourg and Liebknecht. She also admitted that it was a mistake to enter into an alliance with the imperial military. But it is not really surprising that the SPD defends its history. For instance, the party foundation is called Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, Friedrich Ebert Foundation in English. Today, the SPD is a pro-imperialist, corrupt capitalist party. It is the party of Ebert and Noske through and through. In 2018, on the 100th anniversary of the November Revolution, bourgeois historian Gerd Krummeich said, quote, I would have done it myself like this. No matter what cowardly defense and confusion made by the Social Democrats, it can be said without a single doubt that they bear chief responsibility for the murder of the symbols of the German revolutionary movement and the subsequent cover-up. Major Pabst muddied the waters for decades about his role in the murder and only openly admitted giving the execution orders for the first time in 1961 when he wrote, quote, This decision to eliminate the two pernicious and docile pupils of Moscow was not easy for me. After which the West German government issued a statement calling the murder a, quote, legitimate execution. The Vorwärts editorial office posted through Facebook and Twitter that it was the Spartacus uprising itself that had led to the deaths of Luxembourg and Liebknecht. The SPD had only defended democracy with the help of the military. The repeated excuse is that all happened in order to prevent bloodshed. Which is ironic, not only because of the massacre the Freikorps had conducted in the previous day, but since the murder on January 15th was a prelude to the thousands of murders perpetrated by the SPD-led forces in the following months of the Noske period in the following civil war. And according to Hafner, also the prelude to the millions of murders in the following decades of the Hitler period and Hitler's party would soon emerge out of the accumulated and consolidated strength of the Freikorps movement. The revolution was seriously weakened, but it had not been defeated yet. Until May of 1919, thousands would die in a civil war. The Social Democrats had solved none of the urgent problems of the working class. Famine was as bad as during the war, factories were closing and unemployment was rising. In Berlin alone unemployment tripled and reached half a million in March. Many workers who thought they had won with a supposedly socialist party ruling were disillusioned very quickly. The revolutionaries were desperately trying to recover from the defeat in Berlin. Franz Mehring and Johann Knief soon died from impaired health. Leo Jogiches, who struggled to keep the organization together, was arrested in March and was killed under the usual pretext of trying to escape. 
Clara Zetkin kept being politically active in the following years. After the Nazis banned the KPD in 1933, she went into exile to the Soviet Union, where she died in the same year at the age of 75. Just like the first phase of the revolution, the civil war is usually missing from the history curriculum, especially because of the shameful collaboration between the victors, the social democrats with the Nazis, and the bloodshed they caused on the working masses. In various regions the left was still in power. In Bremen, for instance, the independents voted with the communists to declare Bremen an independent socialist republic. A proletarian people's army was to enforce the dictatorship of the proletariat by banning the bourgeois press and urging bourgeois officers to surrender their arms within 24 hours. But on January 30th, Berlin gave the order to their troops to move into Bremen. Councils in the surrounding regions promised their support for the defense of Bremen and by February 3rd, the Freikorps began their attack and deadly fights followed. It took months to break the spirit of workers who were fighting and striking in defense of their interests. In both revolution and war, timing is everything. Hours can decide over victory and defeat. And one strategic mistake can cost you victory. This was no different during the Civil War, where the revolutionary forces were still greater than the ones of the government, who was in the process of rebuilding and consolidating its military power. In the Ruhr, this was particularly crucial in February, when the masses of the Ruhr began to revolt. It was crucial to fight Bremen and the Ruhr separately. If the left attacked the government forces from two flanks at the same time, it could have won quite easily. So Ebert and Noske did their very best to make sure it delayed the confrontation in the Ruhr until Bremen had been dealt with. The Ruhr was the industrial center of Germany, the place where the Thyssen and Krupps ruled, today forming the massive Thyssen-Krupp corporation. The Thyssen and Krupps were crucial in financing Hitler's rise to power a few years later. Thus, the Ruhr was and still is the place where the industrial proletariat is concentrated. The workers there had already successfully forced their employers to compromise on an 8-hour working day and now they wanted a 6-hour day and socialization of the mining industry, which was so frequently promised by the social democrats. The workers quickly saw through those false promises. The union leadership there was against unofficial strikes. The social democrat dominated councils purged all revolutionary elements and foreign security forces shooting multiple demonstrators dead in December and January. Eventually the workers managed to appoint the communist Karski to head a commission for socialization who demanded socialization and threatened with a general strike if the government would obstruct. While pretending to be for socialization and always procrastinating on the false promise, the Freikorps moved into the Ruhr after they smashed Bremen. The workers formed the first Ruhr Red Army and they were soon to clash with the Freikorps. The Ruhr workers gained significant territory. Ultimately, the Freikorps crushed the first wave of strikes, but the region wasn't the Social Democrat stronghold anymore. The most prominent fight was to occur in Bavaria, where the November Revolution had spurred the Bavarian Soviet Republic. The fight in Bavaria can be considered the closing stage of the German Revolution. Journalist Kurt Eisner, an independent and a follower of revisionist Bernstein, was its leader. To many, it was a surprise that a Soviet Republic would emerge in Bavaria, one of the most conservative states and one where industry was barely developed. However, the newly founded republic had some serious weaknesses. In December, Eisner agreed to some compromises with the Social Democrat government, such as allowing them to set up a security force there. Eisner grew increasingly unpopular among the population. In February, he decided to fully resign powers to the government and was shot dead by a right-wing count on his way to the resignation speech. Weeks of non-government followed, and amidst the worsening crisis, in April a weird thing happened. 
A massive coalition of social democrats, independents, anarchists and communists, organized by right-wing social democrat Minister of War Schneppenhorst, came together to decide on a new council republic. But a guy who would soon become the most prestigious communist leader in Bavaria, Eugen Levine, put forth his reservations, quote, I have just learned of your plans. We communists harbor profound suspicion of a Soviet republic initiated by the social democrat minister Schneppenhorst and men like Dur, who up to now have combated the Soviet system with all their power. At best, we can interpret their attitude as the attempt of bankrupt leaders to ingratiate themselves with the masses by seemingly revolutionary action, or worse, as a deliberate provocation. We know from our experience in northern Germany that the Social Democrats often attempted to provoke premature actions which are the easiest to crush. A Soviet Republic cannot be proclaimed at a conference table. It is founded after a struggle by a victorious proletariat. The proletariat of Munich has not yet entered the struggle for power. After the first intoxication, the Social Democrats will seize upon the first pretext to withdraw and thus deliberately betray the workers. The independents will collaborate, then falter, then begin to waver, to negotiate with the enemy and turn unwittingly into traitors. And we, as communists, will have to pay for your undertaking with blood. Levine went on to call this project a pseudo-Soviet republic. It could not be established top-down. It had to be linked to the masses. Quote, In the offices sit the same royal functionaries. In the streets, the old armed guardians of the capitalist world keep order. Not a single bourgeois has been disarmed, not a single worker has been armed. The more recent argument of American bourgeois historian Mitchell is not much different. Quote, Schneppenhorst did not have a clear idea of what he was doing. By inviting the KPD into a coalition government, he hoped to commit its leaders to official responsibility for their words and deeds, which could then, by some means or other, be vigorously opposed. On April 12, the communists seized power in Bavaria with Eugen Levine as head of state. However, by now, the proto-fascist Freikorps had grown into a powerful nationwide political force. According to Noske, there were 68 official Freikorps encompassing almost 400,000 men at the end of the civil war. They were powerful enough to swiftly reconquer Bavaria in early March, causing the deaths of over 600 people, of whom 335 were civilians. The German Revolution was the training ground for anti-communist currents that would be crucial in oppressing the workers' movements in the following decades, and arguably to this day. The German bourgeois government may condemn its Nazi past, But one has to be naive to not think that as soon as a successful proletarian movement threatens to dismantle class society, it will gladly crush it with the help of its most reliable fascist detachments. New reactionary organizations representing a fascism with a new face to be more palatable to the masses will be massively funded, just how the rich funded the anti-Bolshevik League, Pops' GKSD, and later Hitler's party. The armed oppression against the left movement continued until 1923. In 1920, the German government was briefly overthrown by the nationalist current in the so-called Kapp-Putsch, which was very short-lived and removed again after mass demonstrations. The Nazi party, which was founded in 1920 in Munich and emerged out of the anti-communist Freikorps movement, was supposed to draw people away from the still strong communist organizations to the Völkisch Nationalist movement. Under the leadership of Adolf Hitler and supported by former army chief Erich Ludendorff, it was heavily involved in the violent crushing of the revolutionary left forces during the second half of the German Revolution. Paul von Hindenburg, who together with Erich Ludendorff was the de facto ruler of Germany and the chief enemy of the working class, would become president of Germany in 1925 until his death in 1934. One year before his death, he would appoint Adolf Hitler as chancellor of Germany. And the rest is history. 
A video discussing the capitalist's role in the rise of Hitler is coming soon, so if you don't want to miss that one, make sure to subscribe to the channel. So, let's conclude. Solidaritätslied. The German Revolution has a world historic significance for Marxists. It's part of the dreams and expectations of a worldwide revolution. The real potential and confirmation that class consciousness does not know any borders. It's where social democracy manifested as a real force, but not as a movement to abolish the fundamentally exploitative system of capitalism, but as a reconciler between capital and labor, as a reformist ideology channeling revolutionary energy into the theater of parliamentarism, into the dream of making capitalism humane and green. It was a period of great chaos where history was happening within hours, power and momentum shifting quickly from one end to the other every day, overwhelming the most capable and conscious leaders. There are two ways of looking at revolutionary history. One is to criticize the enemies and make people aware of their wicked tactics. The other is to provide a critique of your own side and draw lessons for future attempts at revolution. Both perspectives are very important and none is in isolation from the other. Ultimately, I think, in partial agreement with the authors I have mentioned in these videos, that the root cause of the failure lies in the missing, united organizational capabilities to guide and unite the masses effectively and decisively. Without a united revolutionary organization, there cannot be a revolutionary movement. This is what it takes to beat a unified ruling class, who in times of crisis or revolution is more united than ever. The German Revolution teaches us that a revolutionary situation can arise within a short period of time and that a single spark can start a great fire. Thus, it is indispensable to work towards it, to not only prepare for it, but to actively work to bring it about, independently with a clear separation to the reconcilers, to propagate courageously and to effectively make it clear to the workers how they were betrayed and how they are being betrayed still. If one talks about the German Revolution as a history of betrayal, one will more often than not be confronted by some reference to a liberal commentator who denies that a betrayal happened calling the betrayal narrative a myth. But who is asking liberals for their opinion on this matter? If you see the failure of a socialist revolution as a positive outcome, why do you bother with debunking the betrayal narrative to begin with? An article in the corporate-owned Focus, one of the three most widely circulated German weeklies, aims at showing how the story of betrayal is misguided. In it, it is explained how Ebert merely wanted to save democracy from Bolshevism and how he collaborated with the monarchy because the German people had to incrementally learn democracy by doing. They were not ready for it yet. The article says, quote, but the SPD would rather be ashamed of having given priority to democracy over socialism back then. Yet, the successful struggle to establish parliamentary democracy is a great achievement. Of course, the SPD does not want to do that. It has to claim a veneer of social progress, a superficial continuity rooted in its Marxist past. It has to still play the role of being the representatives of the weak in order to fool the working class. It is crucial to understand the German Revolution as a betrayal, not just as a lost fight. The counter-revolutionaries didn't simply crush the left with pro-capitalist propaganda. Through an Aikido-type strategy, it undermined the onslaught of the revolutionary masses by acting like revolutionary socialists themselves, only to suffocate it from within. Of course, Ebert, Noske and Scheidemann were never planning to end class society, but it is crucial for the workers' movement to detect and point out those who claim to be for socialism in name only. This is why it is crucial to study Marxist theory, because it quite concretely deals with the history of such maneuvers and is not just some abstract philosophizing as many would like to paint it. To keep social peace, capitalism needs its labor lieutenants, 
fake representatives of the working class. People who make sure the contradiction between workers and capitalists is not resolved by the overthrow of the exploiters. But you cannot keep social peace without lying about the nature of the capitalist state or liberal democracy, without fooling the workers that it works for them, or that they will just have to vote more if they want it to work for them. Social democracy and revisionism are in fact essential to the continued rule of imperialism. The capitalists could not have stopped the German revolution by simply fighting it. They neither had the manpower nor the workers on their side. They have to subvert it from within, through lying, deceiving, buying time through joining hands with the independents, through making promises, or by proclaiming a fake socialist republic. When revolution breaks out in your country, there is no doubt that there will be new Eberts and Noskes, supposed representatives of the working class who will be in favor of the revolution in name only, preparing to crush it in the service of capital. Another argument put forward against the betrayal narrative in that article, and one which is frequently repeated by today's social democrats, is that the majority simply didn't want a proletarian revolution. They wanted the SPD to win. Aside from the shaky evidence for this, it is a childish analysis of societal processes at best. It's highly reductive and mechanistic because there's clearly a relationship between those who have immense influence on a movement and those with less influence. Are we really going to pretend, for instance, that the bourgeois-controlled media has no influence upon the masses? That all the millions the German oligarchs put into building up the Freikorps, the anti-Bolshevik League, and collaboration with the Social Democratic Party apparatus, that they didn't have a significant impact on what ordinary people thought? Ideas are never in a vacuum. They are produced and reproduced through material reality, through the filters of money and power. This retort to justify the course of history by claiming that it was simply the will of the people is a cheap excuse to justify the status quo. The consciousness of people is not fixed, they engage with and adapt to the political reality around them. And the revolutionary situation was there without a doubt. The potential for the overthrow of German capitalism was as real as it can be. If the revolution had succeeded, it would have had a massive influence on the consciousness of the masses, and it would continue to transform it with each subsequent success. As Italian communist Antonio Gramsci has written, quote, The active man in the masses has a practical activity, but has no clear theoretical consciousness of his practical activity, which nonetheless involves understanding the world insofar as it transforms it. His theoretical consciousness can be historically in opposition to his activity. One might almost say that he has two theoretical consciousnesses, one which is implicit in his activity and which in reality unites him with his fellow workers in the practical transformation of the real world, and one, superficially explicit or verbal, which he has inherited from the past and uncritically absorbed. And it is that dynamic view of human consciousness, the potential for the individual consciousness to transform through the class struggle, which the ruling class and their media representatives fear most. Chris Harmon quotes an observer of the Ruhr, who wrote in the summer of 1919, quote, When I left Hamborn in the last summer of 1918, the workers almost to a man were majority social democrats. When I went there recently, the workers, to a man, were communists. The SPD tries to play down their role in the murder of Luxembourg by just blaming Noske. But the murder of Luxembourg was, as I hope to show with this series, only the culmination of a watering down of Marxism, both on a practical and theoretical level. Theory and praxis go hand in hand. The constant push to revise Marxism into liberalism is something Marxists today, as they always have, have to combat ferociously, because theory guides real-world actions and produces real-world consequences. When Eduard Bernstein proclaimed his revision of Marxism on the basis of a supposed stability of capitalism and a rejection of historical materialism, 
emphasizing parliamentary reform over revolution. It had both a basis in the actual practice of the SPD at the time and affected it in return. Bernstein rejoined the SPD after 1919 and was again a member of the Reichstag from 1920 to 1928. He remained a committed reformist. He died in December of 1932 in Berlin. For all the obvious critique against open right-wingers such as Ebert and Noske, it is not as easy to spot and criticize the centrists, the modern Kautskis, who will try to salvage unity between the left and the right, and thus confuse many on the left about the antagonistic nature of two opposing political lines. One example of how theoretical positions can undermine revolutionary organization and how the center can play into the right's hand is Kautsky's theory of ultra-imperialism. On the eve of World War I, Kautsky suggested that the capitalist classes should come to an agreement and peacefully divide the world among themselves. The aim was to show how many Marxists are wrong about the nature of capitalism that capitalism doesn't always automatically lead to imperialist war. Similar to the formation of cartels, he explained, ultimate peace can also be achieved by unity of rational capitalists who also suffer from war without the need to overthrow the capitalist system. Quote, there is no economic necessity for continuing the arms race after the world war, even from the standpoint of the capitalist class itself. Every far-sighted capitalist today must call on his fellows. Capitalists of all countries unite. Lenin took great issue with this. While he agreed that there is a tendency of economic development towards the formation of a quote, single world trust, capitalism is inherently stricken with such great contradictions that imperialism won't find harmony before the socialist revolution, which he correctly regarded as a necessity. Two world wars have occurred since, and another one is not unlikely. Quote, can one... However, deny that in the abstract, a new phase of capitalism to follow imperialism, namely a phase of ultra-imperialism, is thinkable. No. In the abstract, one can think of such a phase. In practice, however, he who denies the sharp tasks of today, in the name of dreams about soft tasks of the future, becomes an opportunist. The development in this direction is proceeding under such stress, with such a tempo, with such contradictions, conflicts and convulsions, not only economical, but also political, national, etc., etc., that before a single world trust will be reached, before the respective national finance capitals will have formed a world union of ultra-imperialism, imperialism will inevitably explode, capitalism will turn into its opposite. This is just an instance of a theoretical dispute that reflects a larger political struggle against opportunism. By conceiving of capitalism as stable, by regarding non-revolutionary times as permanent, or by thinking, for instance, that the capitalist mode of production will somehow find a way to solve the environmental disaster within the next two decades before it becomes irreversible, one plays into the notion that revolution is a thing of a distant future, that there is no rush to build up revolutionary organization today. And then, when the next inevitable major crisis arrives, and a revolutionary situation presents itself, Marxists are left with a weak organizational basis, having to react ad hoc to events which overwhelm them and make them commit great mistakes. Marxism constantly develops and updates, as it should. But its essence is to reach communism, not capitalism. If Marxism means making capitalism humane or achieve a vaguely defined socialism through reform and capitalist means sometime in a distant future, it doesn't mean anything. If it doesn't mean revolution, smashing the bourgeois state rather than reforming it, ending class society and building the worldwide revolution, it doesn't mean anything. What seems dogmatic to people looking at Marxist movements from the outside is often justified in the real practice of making revolution and grappling with the history of betrayal. To be able to do this, one must not only be politically conscious and well-informed, but courageous, as Karl Liebknecht, to take the correct stance even if the majority is against you. 
Unity is important, but real Marxist unity is achieved through struggle, not concessions. To have the courage to break away from a party or organization which constantly makes concessions to the right. Revolution is a protracted process which must be taken seriously. A single uprising will not end capitalism. It needs to be prepared and struggled for on the basis of long-term strategy with the leadership of a mass-based revolutionary organization. Firmly and courageously committed to Marxism and against opportunism. If there is one thing we can learn from the German Revolution, it is this. Karl Kautsky tried to push the SPD to the left by co-authoring the Heidelberger program of the SPD in 1925, trying to lead it back to a more anti-capitalist direction. But of course, this was futile. The SPD has been one of the chief representatives of German capitalism ever since. Germany today is a capitalist imperialist state with the fourth highest GDP in the world, yet has over 13 million people living in poverty while being home to over 100 billionaires. Income and wealth inequality are on the rise. Public sectors are continuously privatized. Rent is exploding in every major city with about 700,000 homeless people in one of the richest countries in the world. Parliamentary democracy, in which people are allowed to vote every few years, but are ultimately subject to the investment decisions of a few oligarchs, is not what the revolutionaries want. They want the means of production to be owned by society as a whole, to have the majority make the decisions of the economy, to have the majority determine over its own future. And that's what Ebert, Scheidemann, Noske and co. made sure would not happen through barefaced lies, collaboration with proto-fascist and monarchist forces, and cold-blooded murder. They have betrayed the principles their own party was founded on. They betrayed Marxism and socialism. Both they and the current leadership of the SPD are the chief traders of the German working class, lapdogs of the bourgeoisie, and appeasers and absorbers of radical currents by doing what they are experts in, promising workers a better future while superficially reconciling the antagonism between them and their exploiters. The working class movement will never forget their betrayal. The workers of Germany are hardened by their history and carry these lessons in their memories. Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht may be dead, but their revolutionary spirit lives on.